Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this week's Gitpod community office hours. Um, so just so um, for those who don't know and for those uh, who are here for the first time, um, we do these bi-weekly and we usually have community members come up on stage and share things they've built with Gitpod um, or just share um, something interesting that uh, relates to remote dev environments in general, whether that's like improving developer experience or like uh, moving your workflow to the cloud. Um, and so, so yeah, and by default everyone is like should be muted if you're not talking and we usually have like a demo and space for questions after the demo is over um if you do want to ask any questions and you don't want to go off mute um if you go on the top right hand corner there's a little oh. chat bubble um and it says show chat so if you click on show chat feel free just to type your questions in there um, and then i will read them out during the uh, questions section after Sarah's um, after our guests have um, uh, done their demo and today is super exciting because we have one of our community heroes Sarah um, who does a lot in the Astro community and um, she's been an active member of uh, the Gitpod community uh, for the last few months now and it's so awesome it's always awesome to have um, community heroes like show off what they've built and I'm especially excited about this one because I don't know much about the Astro community and I'm also fully aware that Sarah has started the hashtag hashtag no local dev environment so yeah it's <laughs> that's like that's like the best part um okay so I will like stop talking like I said uh, feel free to ask questions uh, in the chat and I will pick them up later um, but yeah I think let's let's begin Sarah do you want to kick us off so this is uh this is life when you don't have a fancy machine and this is one reason that I continue despite all this to uh to work on Chromebooks and on tablets and remotely in the cloud because there are enough people on M1s uh, who, uh, who don't have to deal with these issues. And I think it's great if I can be the person. Uh, we talk about, when we test the Astro Doc site, we talk about Sarah's evil phone. So my phone is a Galaxy Note 8, which is a weird size, it's a weird operating system, and it's quite old, and it stopped receiving updates. Uh, I also, what I tried to share with you, have a 14 inch tablet. So you can never be quite sure what kind of view you're gonna get uh, because you're gonna have Android apps. You might have them stretched. So this, uh, what you're seeing is a real life part of my day is I am constantly making little adjustments at the end trying to figure out what is going to make stuff work. Uh, so here we are right now on my Chromebook, which I will warn you is lower powered, and so sometimes doesn't like these larger Discord calls. So if I cut out again, you know I'm not, I'm not that far away. Um, I'm, I'm trying something frantically behind the scenes because this is what I do. Uh, now, if I had my tablet, I had a few screenshots. I was just sort of going to warm things up by introducing how I got here, um, learning all this stuff on a tablet, um, on a Chromebook. And uh, um, that even learning the code wasn't, wasn't always easy. Um, uh, then let me get my dates right. So mm -hmm. a couple years ago at uh, React Conf, I had a talk about learning in the browser. And this, uh, it's one thing to learn about code in the browser because especially now there's some cool tools, there's tutorials, but then once you're off on your own and it's time to go build something, you have to figure out how to also build uh, in the cloud with tools that you're not yet really super familiar with. You're not even quite sure what all the stuff is called. So it can be a little more difficult to search when you're not sh exactly sure the vocabulary that you're searching. 
So this was when I just typed in uh, write React Online. That was my first search term. And it ended, take, ended up taking me to Code Sandbox and Replit and CodePen and StackBlitz and eventually to Gitpod, which is now where I do all of my coding. Um, I run um, a choir website. I have a, I have a personal website. Um, I, I am managing the AstroDocs site, both as a site and in terms of overseeing content. And all of my daily work is done in Gitpod. It's on a Chromebook. It's on a tablet. And in fact, I have some little notes here about what, uh, what Gitpod brings to my daily experience. And so it now seems appropriate to mention that what Gitpod does bring to my daily experience is when this Chromebook crashes mid task, when I'm on Gitpod, I instantly go to the tablet and in less than two minutes, I haven't lost a keystroke for anything. So when you're working on these, these kinds of devices, um, this is this is why even uh, even now when I could justify getting a getting a laptop, um, I sometimes I, I delight a little bit in the challenge of what goes wrong and in keeping me on my toes. Um, so certainly that's that's one aspect of Gitpod that has that has really helped. Uh, with this kind of environment that I've chosen here. Sarah, Sarah sorry, yep. just sorry to interrupt. Are you sharing the right screen? Because right now we're seeing the Astro page, or are you just, is that is that correct? You are seeing the right screen because the other stuff I had at the moment was on the tablet. So. Yes, all good, all good, will, carry on, sorry. Yeah, I'll, thanks, no, it's good to check because it's obviously with everything that's happened today. And I'm seeing Axon ask, how do you continue your coding when you have no internet? And uh, so I will, I will turn that around a little bit before I answer that specifically, because the very last screen you would have seen on the tablet was the shot of me and my tablet hooked up to a battery pack during Hurricane Fiona that uh, I just went through here in Atlantic Canada and we were out of power for three days. But because I hoard battery packs, I had enough juice to keep the tablet running, um, but the phone service was still up in Canada. So it was funny because had I worked, I realized that had I had a traditional laptop with code on it, in that situation, I wouldn't have had the power to keep going to code. But actually the entire three days we lost power, I could keep working on Gitpad because the tablet was a lower powered device. Um, now, yes, the, the cell service was still up, but that is, that's actually now I'm finding a more common concern is worrying about power versus worrying about connectivity. So in terms of worrying about when there's no connectivity, um, the funny story there is I learned to code an awful lot on pen and paper in notebooks. I have a stack of notebooks. Um, and because a lot of what I'm doing is content now, um, as long as I have source material, I can do a lot of writing. I can even do uh, sketching things out. I can do some coding that way. But I actually find that it's more of a concern for me to be without power than for me to find myself in a position without connectivity. And so I just literally got through three days of a hurricane and mostly didn't have to stop my workflow because everything was in Gitpod versus on a big machine that there's no way I could have kept it charged for three days. So uh, that's, that's sort of my story there. Um, if only we could have kept the fridge on longer, but uh, yeah, that's. Oh, I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the chat now and seeing the coding pads. Very exciting. So yeah, um, I wanted to show you me using Gitpod on the tablet 
because the tablet, and that's why astro.new is here, as I, I was going to launch from there. I can I can show you some stuff on the, uh, I can show you on the Chromebook what I would have showed you on the tablet. Because the, um, the thing that I thought when Pauline first said, oh, does anybody want to show what they're doing? And I said, well, I don't think what I'm doing is terribly interesting. I mean, I'm managing the AstroDocs on Gitpod on a, on a tablet. And Pauline said, I think that is kind of interesting. And I think people might want to see that. Um, what does make that interesting is, as I mentioned, I have a huge tablet, but it is still a tablet. So a lot of what I have access to are mobile apps on the tablet. Um, I have a keyboard attached to it. I have the, the cover that comes with it. I have a, um, an S Pen with it and I, I am known for handwriting so much of my stuff. I've even tried, I've even tried handwriting into Gitpod and I have added little H1 tags that way just to prove that I could. Um, if we go to astro.new, which is now where I am here, uh, first thing I wanna show you is that one thing that we did do at Astro is make sure that all our starter templates can be opened in a variety of online uh, services to preview them. So we've got the Git pod here. Sarah, I actually have a question. Um, and yep. my, my question is with your developer experience now um, with, with Git pod right now, what is something that's almost like a wish list of things you'd like to see improve on Git pod as part of your mobile and tablets experience? Great question. And I was going to show you one of the funny workarounds I do. Uh, when you open Gitpod on a tablet, you cannot ease, you cannot with your touch or with an attached mouse, you can't resize the panes of anything. So there are keyboard commands for hide the terminal or show the terminal. I was going to show you how I go command um, control command P to get into the command palette and I search for lower the height of the terminal. And then what I can do is I can make the terminal like one line shorter. And then I just do the exact same command again and I can make the terminal one more line shorter. And then I do that three or four times because I actually tend to like a smaller terminal when I'm just writing content. I don't need to see that much of the terminal. Um, the same is true for making the Explorer pane wider or narrower. You can hide it and you can show it easily, but if you want to make it slightly smaller, that is again command palette and uh, there is a command in there for widen the editor or make the editor narrow. And again, there's no keystroke attached to it. So I have to go into the command palette each time and do that multiple, multiple bits. So I can tell you as someone who, the first thing I always wanna do is resize all my, all my panes uh, in, my, in my editor there, that is a wish list. I would love to be able to better compensate for the fact that I can't do that either by touch on my touch screen or with a mouse. How's that for one? That's a very good one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is just a reminder. If anyone has any questions for Sarah, drop them in the chat. Um, but yeah, I wanted to know one more, if, if you have any more, like in your wish list. I'm just curious. I think, uh, I don't know if you read my comment above, but I, um, I'm just particularly interested in like mobiles and tablets developing uh, in the future generally, just because iPads look more and more like laptops these days. And sometimes I'm like, I wish I could just touch my MacBook, like have it as a touch screen. And I'm like, in the future, an iPad will be all I need. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm, I'm, I am I'm was really excited to have you on board so you can talk about your experience. But yeah, one more, one more uh, wish list item. So let's see, one more wish list item. Um, I guess too, when, so here's the, here's a specific one and then I'll generalize it. So the keyboard case that I have with my tablet has a sticky enter key. Um, so that's not that in and of itself isn't unique to a tablet experience. Um, but when, 
when you're on a tablet, it is a lot easier for your accessories to have slightly wonkier connections than when you're developing on a full machine. So you never know what kind of keyboard someone is necessarily attaching a tablet to. So if someone has an M1, you can kind of be sure like the hardware is all in one. You, you know what they're working with. On a tablet, um, people can be attaching any number of different things, um, even plugging in a, a flash drive, it plugging in a, you know, a lower powered charger versus a higher powered charger. There's all kinds of things that tablets are more sensitive to in general than uh, all in one based hardware. So I do sometimes find, and, and with them being touch screens, uh, it, it, sometimes touch is really not forgiving on a lot of, in a lot of environments that are expecting you to be working uh, primarily with a mouse, primarily not touching the screen. So uh, those are some those are some things that I notice too. Is that uh, because my tablet is maybe more sensitive in general to the wind blowing past it or anything that sort of comes into its general sphere. Uh, then you tend to experience more hiccups. That would be another thing I would say. Um, I'm looking at, I'm looking through the chat here and someone is saying, you have a Chromebook too. I thought you said, why isn't that your main device? And in fact, I bought the tablet because my Chromebook is now more than six years old. It's struggling. Um, I have a Chromebook that I am all ready to all ready to purchase and it's not yet available in Canada. I just re just the other day responded to a Reddit thread of someone who lost their uh, most of their possessions in this hurricane and is looking for Canadian advice for where they can go to pick up a Chromebook because we're just we're not in the same kind of market as the US or you know some of the larger European centers that uh, that where you have a bit more choice our options are limited i am i am trying to get to to get through on this 6 year old chromebook now until the um, until the super nice high powered one that is that is a, starting to be available in the US is available in Canada so that would be another thing is, is don't always assume that the Chromebook is actually more powerful than the tablet. My tablet is brand new and it's blazing fast, but mostly runs Android apps. So there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of trade-offs here when you just decide you're all in on this and this is how you're going to do it. Uh, you order a Chromebook to one of those mail forwarding services in the U.S. Um, the Chromebook I want, the one I'm waiting for, I have done that in the past. That that has been an option. Um, the Chromebook I want is shipping in the U.S. March 2023. And because it's the one I want, there's, you know, this tablet here was the intermediate device. It's the one that's that's powerful enough. But again, now I'm I'm at the mercy of Android apps. If I'm lucky. Uh, because apps that also have tablet interfaces, sometimes they'll force you to use those. And then sometimes developers often don't keep their tablet interfaces as current as the phone apps. So if I were on a phone, it would be super easy to screen share with you right now. But it's because uh, it's been a few days since I've tricked the tablet into thinking it was a phone that the screen sharing that was working last week is not working today. Uh, I have another um, question. Looking... Oh yeah, uh, I have another question, Sarah. Um, just because you were um, also going to talk about Astro ge generally, can you touch on how, like, what Astro is for those who don't know, and also how uh, other people, how you've been able to use Gitpod to, um, I guess, increase contributions and make that whole um, uh, reduce the friction uh, in terms of uh, contributing to Astro. Sure. Um, yeah, so Astro is uh, a web framework for building websites. Um, when I came out of my, you know, learning responsive design and some JavaScript and React, 
um, and started to build my site, you know, then you're looking at, okay, well, do you want a Gatsby site? Do you want an Eleven D site? Do you want a Hugo site? And this was right around the time Astro was getting popular and a few people were talking about it. So I stumbled into that community and much like I enjoy a challenge apparently in my daily life, um, I thought, well, there's lots of resources out there for figuring out how to make a Gatsby site. There is so little about figuring out how to build an Astro site. So I thought if I'm new and Astro's new, maybe this is a good time to look into it. Um, the nice thing about working with Astro is the Astro language is it very much builds on HTML. And even though I'm recently new to coding, uh, I was writing HTML back in the 90s. Um, I had, you know, sites where that's what you did. You made HTML files and you uploaded them. And I'm not sure I even had separate CSS files. I think I just inlined some stuff to maybe shift things over on my page. And I, I believe there were tables involved, but we're trying to forget a lot of, a lot of those days. So Astro looked very familiar to me and it let me build a site that I was comfortable building, that I felt I understood all the working pieces, but actually I was still learning React. And so I was, because with Astro, you can combine components from different popular web frameworks. Astro seemed to me to be a perfect site to basically have like supercharged HTML, a nice familiar structure I was used to, uh, with the option to blog about my learning uh, journey and actually put some code samples right in React, right in the blog. So I could build a component, I could write about it, uh, but I didn't have to maintain a full React site, um, which uh, was still a little newer to me. So that all became very exciting and I thought it's interesting, it's different, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and then what tends to happen when you try something new and you get in when it's all very new, there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere else to go to learn about Astro really except the Astro Discord. So nobody was writing blog posts yet. There weren't a ton of videos yet. So I ended up moving in part-time to the Astro Discord because that's the only place to get answers, to um, ask questions, to hang out with other people who are uh, trying, this, trying this thing. And uh, yeah, so I just ended up helping, learning, helping other people, and then eventually got to the point where I had a pretty good foundation in Astro itself. And as Astro got bigger and as we got more people in the community, the needs of the documentation grew. Uh, my background is also, I have a degree in English. I was an English and a math teacher for the longest time. So I started stepping in to help with documentation as well. Um, and so answering and support threads, turning, looking at the user's questions and then figuring out how to translate that into better documentation. And while at the same time, being able to maintain an Astro site, which is our documentation site that runs on Astro uh, and improve the content to it as well. So that, that sort of became the niche that I that I fell into. The Astro community is is wonderful. We have a really active docs crowd. You can walk into our Discord and you can self-assign your role team docs and then you can get, you know, pinged messages from me saying there's some PRs that need to be reviewed or there's a new feature and we'd like someone to write about it or um, in a support thread, we also have our support squad that you can, again, self-assign your uh, self-assign a rule. And uh, if you're in a support thread and somebody says, oh, the docs don't say that, or, oh, this should really be in the docs, then our support squad will ping the doc squad and we'll be like, okay, time to make an issue, time to improve the docs. Um, and all of this I have been able to do with, with Gitpod. Um, when there are so many people working on the site, it's kind of refreshing that if I need to make some edits to the site, I just go to the repository on GitHub and I click the Gitpod button 
and the current exact site as is opens fresh. I don't have to worry about anything cached on my machine. I don't have to worry um, that there's something weird going on on my machine related to the code. There's all kinds of other weird stuff going on, but related to the code, no, I pull fresh, get something new every time, and it's a really, uh, really convenient way to contribute back to the docs. It's we've done screen we've done screen sharing in the Astro Discord where we do some co-writing, uh, co-working on the site together. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we have quite a few of our maintainers are Gitpod users. They might not use Gitpod all the time like I do, but there are several of us there, and we know it's just it's a really convenient way when we've got a lot going on in our documentation site uh, to make sure that our local environment is a variable that we can just remove from the equation when we're, when we're all trying to work on it sometimes simultaneously. Pause for air. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great, Sarah. Thank you so much for that. I was just about, I was typing this, but um, I'll just say it now. There's some ideas I've had just from listening to you for our own community. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, there is a question that's coming from Lou. Um, I think this might be our last one because we've got around 10 minutes left. Um, how, uh, so sorry, um, have, you used, have you used Gitpod to drive contributions to documentation slash core project? Could you speak to that if you have? How has the experience been successful? Have you seen an increase in contribution because of Gitpod? Really good question. So, uh, yeah, great question. So one thing I can tell you is um, we, uh, it, we one of the reasons what I was doing just moments before this, this call started, because I got the time wrong, is I was on a call with one of our core members who is working on a, a GitHub action to mirror uh, the individual starters we had. So when I went to astro.new there to start something up and we have those opening Gitpod buttons, unfortunately right now, because all of our starters are in a mono repo, um, Shal, one of our Gitpod community members here, helped us get to the point where we could launch and uh, start the dev server and navigate in the file menu exactly to the index page of the proper starter uh, when you launch from that astro.new. But unfortunately, because it's in the mono repo, if you look in your file explorer, you see all of Astro. You see all of Astro, you see all of our starter templates. So we can get you so far and you can play with it, but you're really playing in all of Astro. Um, what Nate has just been doing is working on a way to mirror that so that when you click on that button, you can actually get to an individual repository that is mirrored from our mono repo so that core can continue to just make their changes there. And yet the Gitpod people get the same experience that the code sandbox and the Sapwits people get, which is that you're just opening one repository of that starter template. Um, so I can tell you that that's been one that's been one difficulty we've had in terms of uh, having people get on boarded with Astro it, um, using Gitpod is that it's less of a friendly experience um, for our starter templates, but we are working on that. Um, in terms of the documentation, we do have a we do have a number of people who will use Gitpod to open the the documentation repository. Fortunately, that is on its own. Um, I think what has helped is that people realize I do it, and even in the vocabulary I use and in how I describe when someone new comes in and I'm onboarding, I might say things that that are either Gitpod specific or that just assume you're on Gitpod. So the same way when I started to learn code and everybody just assumed there was stuff on your machine and you knew what you were doing there. For me, it's, for our docs people, it's the opposite. I'm like, oh, oh, you're, you're on a machine, okay. And so I think what happens is we sort of promote the, um, the vibe that it's, well, you're not on Gitpod? 
And I, um, so that's, uh, that's, I think, encouraged some people to use Gitpod. I'm not sure that we've seen Gitpodders come uh, specifically because of that or anybody uh, come the other way around. But I do know that we, um, it's, it, it still surprises me that sometimes when I say, oh, Gitpod, and, and somebody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, my Gitpod environment, I'm like, oh, you're using Gitpod too. So I think it's, it's just sort of there and it's just underlying what we do there. Um, and there is another question, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. that. Um, we'll, we'll have David uh, as uh, the last question for today. Um, his question is, what are Gitpod's advantages over Stack Blitz or Code Sandbox, which are, which are both also used in Astro? Yeah, um, there is other, especially once we get this whole uh, mirroring issue out and we can let you actually open one of our starters directly, um, directly from astro.new on Gitpod um, and not as part of the whole mono repo. Um, it, it's, it's a huge advantage using Gitpod in terms of, this is going to sound weird. You have seen what I have gone through today with everything. I can tell you, Gitpod is way more stable on my devices than either StackBlitz or Code Sandbox. I cannot run StackBlitz on this Chromebook. And that's not a that's not a, a diss at stack blitz. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's actually the way <laughs> the way that these run. And code sandbox is usually my 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 safety middle zone. Um, stack blitz is amazing in that so much is done in and by your browser. Now, so that's great for people with hefty browsers. When you're on a device and your browser is the weak link, uh, and instead of going to, to a server to make calls and do all this crunching and stuff, um, that's why Gitpod is rock solid on this six-year-old Chromebook in a way that StackBlitz can't be because it's, it's too powerful. <laughs> um, so that, that's one interesting difference there is the difference is where a lot of the work is done. And so that might make a difference to you when you're using it. Um, Gitpod also provides just a much fuller environment. Uh, specifically with Astro, we have an excellent VS Code extension and it's also on the VS, VXS open registry as well so that we can use it on Gitpod. We have amazing syntax highlighting, code completion. We have all that stuff you'd expect in, uh, in Gitpod with that extension. On things like Code Sandbox and Stackblitz, you, you don't have a full sort of VS Code uh, environment. And you, you have, for Astro in particular, you have syntax highlighting, but you don't have a lot of those editor tools that you do have on Gitpod. So that is another, uh, that's another difference as well, is that the, um, so not only is it, is it kind of beefier and more powerful and there's more stuff that you can do because it's not just trying to use your browser or do things in your browser. Um, Gitpod itself, um, the, um, the pre-build scripts, I mean, just all the stuff that it can do for you is, uh, is a bit of an advantage when you're working at sort of the scale I am with these Astro docs that are translated into eight languages. And uh, we have all these, all these uh, things, go complicated things going on and rendering and stuff like that um, in a way that in Code Sandbox, um, some, I think the doc site is now getting to the point I'm, it might be too large to open in Code Sandbox. Um, and certainly trying to open the starters when they're part of the, the mono repo. So you run into size limitations as well that I just, I don't have in Gitpod. So, I mean, the fact that you've seen what I've gone through today and for me to tell you, no, Gitpod, Gitpod's not the weak link here. It's stable. It's, it's what I can manage with these tools. Uh, hopefully that, that speaks to it right there. Absolutely. I hope that answered your question, David. Um, thank you um, for that. I think we're, we're just a minute 
I've just got a minute left. So thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing. Um, if you have any more questions for Sarah, uh, she hangs out in the Gitpod community. And so feel free to just drop um, her a question publicly in our general um, channel.